Welcome to episode 243 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing fine. Uh, don't think I have too much news to share. You got anything you want to talk about? Um, nothing big at the moment, uh, although I guess I, I should mention that I will be coming on CBP chat also this week, so um, two for one if you really want to listen to me talk. <laughs> awesome. Who else are you going to be on with uh, on CBP chat? Uh, I'm I'm not sure, but it's going to be an episode about. Um, well, I mean, I don't have all the names on hand at the moment, but it's going to be a little roundtable about um, uh, training in this COVID era, basically. Right. Right. Okay. Well, you should definitely tune into that one if you're interested. Okay. Well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got this tweet from uh, Connor Hoekstra, who we've had on the show before. And he says, episode 242 of CPP cast with guest John Turner and host Rob and Jason was so amazing that I set up a blog to write about how awesome it was, hear about TypeScript, Rust Lang, and other programming languages, New Shell, and more. And yeah, Connor, thanks for uh, for writing this blog post. I, I did read through it. It was, uh, he was He was very excited about last week's episode, Jason. He was. He was. And uh, yeah, I know John read the article also and, and liked it. It's, it's very... Um, complimentary towards john and the work that he has done yeah yeah well it was really great talking to uh to your cousin last week it was fun yeah it was okay well we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show you can always reach out to us on facebook twitter or emails at feedback at cbcast.com and don't forget to leave us a review on itunes or subscribe on youtube joining us today are andrew lieberfay and jack mcguire Andrew is a research assistant professor at UNC in the Department of Biochemistry. He got his BA from UVA in Philosophy and Cognitive Science and his PhD from UNC's Department of Computer Science as a postdoc in Brian Coleman's lab at UNC and later in David Baker's lab at UW. He led a team of developers in the rewrite and re-architecturing of the Rosetta Molecular Modeling Program into its current object-oriented form, Rosetta 3. He has worked on algorithm development, protein interface design, and energy function improvement. He sits on the scientific advisory board for Dual Logics, a small biotech spun out of the Coleman Lab at UNC. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. You have way more credentials than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going back and rereading all of these things here. That's um, Although you could have gone to a better school for your undergrad. Nothing oh, personal. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Virginia Tech. I just had to uh, throw that it's out there when I had the opportunity. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Every Thanksgiving also, we meet on the field. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also joining us today is Jack, uh, starting his career as a baby model and took an early retirement at the age of one. He was first exposed <laughs> to C++ while pursuing his bachelor's in chemistry at the University of Rochester, where he wrote programs to predict and design RNA folding patterns. He recently compared, completed his Ph.D. at the University of North Carolina, where he wrote programs to predict and design protein folding patterns. Jack now works at Menton AI on a team that uses quantum computing and machine learning to superpower the Rosetta protein modeling software. Jack, welcome to the show. Thanks, everyone. It's nice to be here. You're also way more credentialed than I am. But I have to ask, serious question, were you actually a baby model? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. I don't lie about that. Um, <laughs> But there's a gimmick, right? So I was I was pretty heavy as a baby. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's really cute. Uh, yeah, so, those Michelin folding arms. Yeah. 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 If there are any babies listening, you know, now's a good time to put on weight. Much better than, <laughs> than later in life. So, so seriously, are you on like, I don't know, like baby food product labels or what? Like, what was it about? I did a few shows where my mom carried me down a runway and... Uh, I don't think I was ever in cattle. But Did this yeah, like no, that was up? my that was my beginning of my career. Was that your college <laughs> fund or what? Like did it actually like affect your life in any way? I don't think I was on that scale. Okay. <laughs> but, have you ever been recognized on the street? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily I lost some of that weight. But <laughs> But if not, maybe. No, I'm still waiting for them to call back for another show, but, you know, I'm kind of reading between the lines there. <laughs> That's terrible. That's funny. 
<laughs> okay, well, uh, we have a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these guys, and then we'll start talking more about Rosetta, okay? All right, so uh, this first one, I don't expect anyone to have actually read this entire paper because it's some 600 pages long, but uh, it's programming languages, a common C slash C++ core specification. And I have to say that's like the only time I've seen C slash C++ <laughs> and I'm okay with it. It was actually used correctly, it would seem. Yeah. 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 That's weird. So this is a proposal basically to, uh, you know, C and C++ have diverged a little bit uh, over recent years and they want to kind of bring it back together to have a common core that both languages share, which I think is a good idea. So a lot of random interesting things in here if you're up to reading it. <laughs> How much of this did you actually read through? Uh, very little, but I, I searched for things that I was interested in. Like oh, okay. constexpr. Mm -hmm. And there is a discussion at the end for future possible changes of adding constexpr and the spaceship operator into C. Really? So that would be part of the common core. Okay. So how much of this then is adding new features to C based on what's been added to C++? Uh, my takeaway is that a lot of it is more... Okay that direction making because c has more uh built-in types i mean mm -hmm. excuse me c++ has more built-in types right so uh that was my takeaway but i don't know if the uh, rest of you had any chance to read this i don't need to yeah andrew or jack do you read through this at all no i looked at it and thought uh uh we're just so heavily c++ focused that i probably <laughs> won't ever need uh like the c features so i kind of um thought i would let you guys just talk about this <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, I thought it was pretty timely after Jason's Doom video to mm. see just how different the two languages were um, and then to see this proposal come out. Um, I did the same thing where I just searched for a few terms. I, I, I searched for ABI and that didn't come up. Uh, but Yeah, I don't think ABI specifically mentioned, but things like the layout of objects to make sure that they are bit compatible, I think, is... Mm is at least discussed. And there's one of those other things in here that was like, should padding be represented as array of void is a question for future discussion. Okay. Array of void. I, I feel like that's an entirely separate can of worms because doesn't that imply that void becomes a regular type? And Matt Calabrese's paper on that hasn't gone anywhere. No, I remember talking to him about that. Yeah, a regular void, it's still in the back of my mind whenever I have to do very generic programming okay. because it comes up. We definitely talked about regular void before on the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, the next thing we have is that uh, JetBrains is going to be hosting a live webinar. I think this is in a couple weeks. I think it was like May 7th. Yeah, Thursday, May 7th at 5... Central Time, 3 GMT. Uh, so if you want to you know, ask the JetBrains team anything about Sea Lion, or I'm sure there are other IDEs, this uh, you know, should be informative. I'm going to try to join it. Yeah, it's cool. And then the last thing we have, uh, another small one, is a third annual C++ Foundation Developer Survey is going out. And I guess they had some questions about whether or not they wanted to even do the survey, but they decided they are going to do it. So you can go ahead and uh, put in your feedback on what's in this. Jason, you have a funny look on your face. I do. There's a minor problem with this, Rob. What's that? It's already been closed. Has it? It has. Am I late? Yeah. Oh, uh, not, you're not very late. You're only late by like uh, one or two days. Um, but it definitely will still be closed by the time this airs. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll just cut this out or I'll look silly. It'll be no, fun. no, no, no. We should say <laughs> it, it's, it's was out and look forward to the results soon. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good spin. Good spin. Yeah. How did I miss that? I guess they don't have uh, this out for very long. No, it was only one week or something okay. like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it closes in one week, and the article is posted on the 5th, so it was from the 5th to the 12th, I guess. Okay. 
Well, uh, why don't we switch gears then and start talking about uh, protein folding uh, and and what it is that Rosetta does, because I don't think a whole lot of our listeners are going to be well-versed on that. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a biochemist, so could one of you maybe give us an overview uh, of what exactly it means? I have zero degrees in in chemistry, just for the record. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'd I'd be happy to uh, take a stab here. Uh, But uh, so... Uh, proteins are uh, molecules that our bodies use for basically everything that they need to do, um, and not just humans, but like all life on Earth. Um, they're actually like the the most important of the molecules. Everybody's heard of DNA from CSI and um, Law and Order, but uh, DNA is is really a rather boring molecule. It doesn't do anything structurally that's very interesting, um, and the only thing it really does is code for proteins. And so proteins. They're, they're the purpose of DNA. Um, they uh, scaffold cells. They communicate with other cells. They receive messages from other cells. They transmit signals. They um, open and close uh, pores uh, in neurons to um, have neurons fire. They're like everything that uh, a cell does. Um, and so um, when you look at DNA, you can read off the sequence of the proteins that the DNA is coding for, um, but you can't really know from just the sequence what the what the protein's going to do or how it's going to behave. Um, really, in order to understand that, you need to know the structure of the protein. Um, proteins, when you put them in water and, and not in a vacuum, they'll adopt this really compact uh, structure. It's really intricately packed, um, and the chemistry is such that the uh, certain amino acids that make up the protein are in on the interior, and other amino acids um, will be on the exterior. And uh, and so, I mean, in broad strokes, you can guess at how things are going to go, but to get really, like, the actual confirmation that a protein adopts, you, you have to be, uh, you have to uh, understand exactly how things are going to come together. Um, and so, uh, what Rosetta does is it tries to search through all the different possible combinations, but it can't enumerate them all. There are just vastly too many, um, much more than there are particles in the universe. Uh, and so um, we have to be kind of smart in the way that we do our sampling, uh, getting bits and pieces from existing structures and trying to combine them to figure out what, what a protein might look like when it's folded. Um, and so we use a, a ton of computational resources to do that. Uh, we burn something like 300 million CPU hours per year um, through uh, a couple different sources. Uh, one of the main ones is Rosetta at home. Um, so people donate their home computers when they're um, idle, just as like a screensaver that you can download through through Boink, the Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computation, I think is what it stands for. Um, and and so we use lots and lots of computers for uh, for running Rosetta to try and predict their structures. And we also try to design new proteins. And proteins are like the smallest motors and actors that we know of. Um, and so if you want to control um, protein biosynthesis, or if you, or I'm sorry, like small molecule synthesis, or if you want to um, uh, try and create new drugs, proteins are really attractive uh, target for that. We actually have a couple um, really neat things in the clinic. Um, there's a, an enzyme that a bunch of undergraduates were able to um, uh, design using Rosetta to break down the protein that's, uh, that causes celiacs. Um, mm. And so you just like take a pill or you drink that protein, it sits in your stomach, and then when you eat bread, it breaks down the, the parts of alpha-glutenin, these uh, glutamine, arginine um, stretches um, that can't be broken down by the, the enzymes that you already have in your stomach. Um, and so for celiac patients, uh, once these uh, proteins leave the stomach and enter the uh, uh, small intestine, then uh, they get an immune response, their antibodies attack uh, this protein that's not really doing anything, but it um, messes up the rest of the small intestine. It causes this large immune uh, inflammation response. And, um, and so if you can just break that down, then then you have uh, like basically a way to eat bread. Uh, yeah, uh, so um, that's pretty exciting. We also have um, uh, people who are pushing a vaccine that's developed by uh, computational modeling in Rosetta for HIV. Um, 
The problem with HIV is that uh, when it when you package it up and send it out, uh, like when it packages itself up uh, and send it out into the bloodstream, um, it wraps itself in the membrane of of uh, the human cell that it left, and so as it's floating around it's basically invisible to the immune system because it just looks like another human cell, except for one protein that sits on its surface. Um, and this protein, GP120, is how it recognizes the next human cell that it's going to invade, um, the helper T cells that HIV kills. Um, and so the immune system can only see this one protein and try to like memorize the shape of that protein. Um, but uh, that protein can vary. Like it has a whole bunch of its surface that isn't terribly important. And, uh, and HIV just mutates a ton so that by the time the immune system has memorized the shape of GP120, it's already, the HIV um, virus in your body has already mutated. Um, so that then like the next time it, it goes floating uh, around through the body, it's no longer recognized by the immune system. Um, but there's one section of GP120, this, this surface protein, that um, can't mutate away because it's going to bind to um, a part of the human protein on the helper T cells, CD4. Um, and the CD4 binding region of GP120 is like the, the exhaust port of the GP120 <laughs> star, right? It's the place where um, uh, if the immune system can target that, if it can memorize that section, then HIV is host. So, um, what the people at Scripps um, who are developing this vaccine have done is create a, a pared down version of GP120 that just presents that exhaust port to the immune system. And, uh, and it's a little more complicated because uh, the exhaust port is also kind of buried deep in a trench of uh, <laughs> GP120. And so only certain part, like certain antibodies of the immune system can recognize uh, things sort of buried that deeply. Um, and so the, the vaccine is actually like a series of proteins that you, that you would inject, um, where the first one is like, let's take a look at what um, something in a trench would look like, and then what is the exhaust port in a trench, and then what's the exhaust port in the trench with the cannons on the surface firing at you, all these extra glycosylation points that are kind of distracting the immune system. Um, and it, you know, it, it works in apes. So you can take an ape and give it basically a human immune system and, uh, and give them the vaccine, and they're able to generate antibodies that neutralize HIV. And so the next step is human trials. And that's going on right now. It's really exciting. Um, now, see, I thought you were going to say the next step would be to take the ape's immune system and put it back in the human that's already <laughs> been immunized. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you could imagine trying to um, treat patients with antibody injections, um, and that may be uh, that may be working. You know, I I uh, should look at that. I, I don't because there are a couple that we sort of understand how using broadly neutralizing antibodies as a therapy for HIV. Right. Um, and I guess there's a couple flaws. One is that you can only inject antibodies. Um, and so you'd, if you were trying to treat someone with HIV, you'd, you'd have to inject them every six months um, and probably for the rest of their lives. Um, and so that's, that's not a good way to eradicate the disease. Um, really to, for eradication, you need a vaccine. You need to be able to to have everyone in the world have the vaccine and then it just disappears, right? Or at least uh, enough people so that you get herd immunity. Um, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna, uh, antibody uh, delivery is not gonna treat 8 billion people. So uh, for either one of you, I, you mentioned Rosetta um, at home and it made me think back to my or university days when I remember folding at home was quite popular and I haven't heard people talk about it recently uh, so much, but are those projects related in any way? It sounds like the same kind of thing with the folding, folding proteins. Yeah. Folding at home does, um, is, is developed by a, a different uh, set of scientists um, out of uh, Stanford. Um, and they do um, very short molecular dynamics simulations on people's home computers. Molecular dynamics is, um, is sort of a different approach to confirmational sampling where you you sort of um, have all the atoms and then you put forces between them so that they'll jiggle um, and then you just let them jiggle uh, like very small time steps like femtosecond time steps um, for a while uh, and if you can 
get enough trajectories, then you can kind of try to predict how proteins will fold. Um, so there's there's two separate problems that are um, that have the same name. One is uh, how do you predict given um, the sequence of a structure, what its folded state is, and people call this protein folding. Um, and then there's the other question, which is um, when a protein is in water, um, how does it actually sample conformations until it gets to its folded state? And that's also called protein folding. So um, uh, to be very technically correct, I sometimes talk about um, protein structure prediction is what we try to do with Rosetta. And protein folding is is more of the reverse. Like you, if you know the folded structure, then you can unfold it um, and sort of watch what pathway it, it travels as it unfolds. And I think that's that's mostly what folding at home does, is it runs lots of very short molecular dynamic simulations. The problem with MD is that you need um, either one of the supercomputers that they've built up in uh, Manhattan um, to do uh, like a millisecond of uh, simulation, or you, um, or you have to run for a very long time on uh, on a single like, like you can do um, like microsecond simulations in MD. But proteins fold on the scale of seconds to tens of seconds, and so um, MD is still sort of outside of what we can do for protein structure prediction. Okay. Okay. Could we maybe talk a little bit more about uh, the Rosetta library itself? Uh, what's the history on it? How long has it been around? Uh, yeah, so Rosetta's been around since the late 90s, um, and it was originally designed for, um, like, written in um, uh, Fortran 77 to do protein structure prediction. Um, and so it took small sections of law of proteins and, and sort of um, made little Frankenstein monsters out of them, um, taking a good section from this protein and a good section from that one and trying to see what a protein would look like if you if you um, glued them together that way. Um, and it uh, um, did remarkably well. Um, and sort of the functionality of Rosetta has expanded over time so that it, it solves more and more problems and eventually protein design, protein loop modeling, um, protein small molecule um, docking, protein protein docking, um, lots of lots of interesting problems in, in the field of computational structural biology. It's become sort of the de facto um, uh, leader in protein structure prediction and, and protein design. Um, uh, and so the software itself, uh, it was written in Fortran. Um, and then uh, back in 2004 or thereabouts, uh, it was mechanically ported into C++. Um, so it was compiled from Fortran into C++ instead of into machine code. Um, and so we had like a C++ version of Fortran code. So global arrays, um, functions that took three parameters, but then interacted with a whole bunch of global data in order to get all of the rest of the parameters. Um, and uh, and like uh, it was it was very difficult to understand. Um, I, I remember um, there was a project uh, of trying to get this one module in Rosetta that that runs protein design to eliminate all the global data in that. And uh, and someone was working on that for like six months and declared themselves done. And I kind of went and looked and realized that um, the only thing that had really changed is just like uh, the three visible parameters and then all the other ones that were sort of sneaking in through the back door, those were no longer. Anyways, so it was, um, it was very difficult to figure out how the code was going to behave. Global data makes things very difficult to, to understand. Um, and you can't multi-thread it in a way. So back in 2007, we um, we started a conversion to um, create a fully object version of Rosetta. And we have eliminated most, but not all of the global data. Um, there's still like a couple things which which are a uh, thorn in my side to this day. Um, but everything is objects now. We don't have these big global arrays. So that's, that's better. How long did that take? Uh, it went remarkably fast. Um, by the end of, uh, let's see, so we started in earnest in February of 2007, and by August we had uh, the design module up and running and like most of the functionality there, and then we began porting like lots of other things over. So then by, yeah, uh, by the end of 2008, um, we sort of declared ourselves done. I mean, we have added a lot more functionality since, so it continues to expand. It's now up to three million lines of C++. Um, a lot of that is, is duplication, but 
Um, a lot of it isn't. Um. <laughs> so did you, uh, you created a whole new structure and then ported the old code into the new structure? Right. Yeah. So we um, so we wanted to um, have the algorithms work as best we could, still with the old code, right? So that as you're porting it over, as you're porting functions over, um, the indices that you're using um, to decide what what position you're going to be cutting your loops at, they made sense in both the um, or, or it was the same indices as before and after. Um, and so we index from one in Rosetta. Like we're scientists written most of Rosetta from so we count how to do the C and C plus plus style counting from zero. So that, that makes it a little bit different. But yeah we did we did um, try to keep the code I mean uh, preserve as much of the original code as possible. Um, because it's easier, right? We didn't want to rewrite every line, um, but we did want to use objects to control how data is stored. And so that's that's sort of the, the biggest change from the the Fortran like C++ to the current version. Right. Uh, Jack, what version of C++ is Rosetta using currently? Uh, so we're using C++ 11. We switched over in 2015-ish. Um, because we needed to wait for all of the supercomputers to get more modern compilers because all of the Rosetta clients uh, have the option to compile their own um, source code locally. Right. And so we needed newer compilers um, to disperse before we could upgrade. However, we do have um, the ability, Rosetta can compile with 14 and 17 with minimal changes which have already been done. So it's it's optional, but we still live at C++ 17, or sorry, C++ 11. So, I'm, I'm, I'm I, well, this is all, your whole story for both of you is very close to home because I've been involved in a project for the last 10 years off and on that is Fortran that has been converted to C++ through an automatic conversion tool and uh, we're struggling through getting some of these things. We've got, I don't even know, thousands of global variables, I think. It's uncountably many, I think. Uh, it's, it's um, anyhow, uh, they are currently on C++11 on the project, and I've been saying, well, can we move to 14 or 17? And and the answer I get back is oh sure we already we we you know we require whatever compilers with Ubuntu eighteen point oh four whatever, but I can't actually get them at the moment to commit to a specific C plus plus version. So I'm still like stuck on C plus plus eleven, which for a few things is really painful. Like generic lambdas, it's much easier to write a lambda C plus plus fourteen in many cases. Um, and so yeah, I was just curious like. Are you specifically stuck on C++11, or did you just draw the line there? Or could you probably switch it to C++14 and no one would even notice because they're using GCC 4.9 or better, or do you know? The people that would notice would be mad, so uh, <laughs> most people would not notice. Um, I often develop in C++14 and 17, then downgrade when it's time to push to master. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's faster, right? There's, there's a reason they have the new tools. In the newer <laughs> versions, um, I never even considered doing that. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of the new things in the fourteen and seventeen can be hacked in eleven. Yeah. So. Um, a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. We don't do as much context for as you. Uh, well, in this project, I'm doing very little context for, although I am pushing them towards it in a few places. Uh, one of the things which might be familiar to you all um, is at the top of every function, we have a const static standard string function name. And it's just a representation of what the current function name is. I don't know if this had some history in the way Fortran used to be done back in the day, so that if there's any log messages after that, then they can just say, use that function name that we hard-coded in here. Well, interestingly, that const static standard string is a performance pessimization every single time the function is entered because it has to do a static check to see a thread safe check to see if that string has been initialized yet. Hmm. And I'm like, if we had C17, I'm doing a find and replace on every single const static string with const 
const const expert static string view. And that would all be free then after that. Um, but, you know, I haven't been able to flip that big switch yet. Uh, anyhow, that's the kind of things that we run into on projects like this. <laughs> Um, one one thing I'm curious about is it sounds like you know both of you are very well versed in C++, but it sounds like uh, a lot of people work on this project uh, are you know maybe more focused on biochemistry and maybe don't have as much C++ background. What's it like having all of those people brought in to uh, to work on Rosetta? Is that a challenge? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, it's it's both a good and a bad thing, right? Um, that there's a, a lot to protein design that's just um, imagination limited, right? There's fewer things that I can imagine than a whole bunch of biochemists can. Um, but at the same time, um, it's it's really kind of nice to have people developing the code who understand all the rules of of what you should not do. Um, like, let's try to avoid global variables, or let's not change a structure in the middle of trying to score it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we um, you know, it, it is a challenge to work with um, as many um, biochemists as we do. Um, but I think uh, it is useful that, that they're there. Um, yeah, so one thing that um, we've relied heavily on in C++ is const um, as like a decorator for functions and um, methods, right? Uh, and uh, so that helps us describe to other um, developers like what we don't want them to do with a, and, and prevent them from doing um, with a, a piece of data like in the middle of execution um, while still also giving us good performance, right? You can hand out the coordinates to a structure um, uh, the in inlined functions without having to worry about them being modified by those functions you're handing them out to. Um, and that's important for like making sure the code is actually computing what you think it should be computing. Um, there have been multiple times where people have suggested, hey, can we change the coordinates of this um, this residue in the middle of scoring the structure? And, and then if you imagine that, then like some amount of scoring has taken place and then the structure changes and then some other amount of scoring takes place and then you're not really sure what you've computed at the end. Um, so uh, const keeps us from, from like having uh, naive biochemists come in and change it. And, and they're naive enough to know that they can't just cast away the const if they so desired, right? That's, uh, that's, that's another right. feature of the language. Right? <laughs> yeah. What's scary, though, is like um, we might talk about this more later, but a lot of our Rosetta users use the Python bindings for it. And right. when you create, when you use objects and functions in Python, const isn't there to protect you. Uh, so sometimes we revert to actually putting the word const in the signature. And just so that um, when you call it from Python, it gives you some idea of what you're not supposed to do. But there's, <laughs> there's no protection uh, for a lot of the users at that level. Yeah, I feel yeah. like as my experience as a trainer, someone said, can I modify this while it's being scored? I would say I have no idea what you're talking about, but no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the the Python thing um, has act, there's like one particular place where uh, in Pyrosetta, like expert users have had like the same bug, where uh, like you can get um, access to the kinematic description of of the the system um, and it's supposed to be a const access like it, it's constant the C++ part but um, but it comes through the Python bindings is just you have the object right you have a pointer to it and so you can modify it directly without the object that's holding it um, so the, the fold tree is describing the kinematics and it's held by the confirmation um, when you change the fold tree in the confirmation like confirmation needs to update some of its other data members um, and so if you change it directly, like, then it breaks. And that's, that's actually um, messed up multiple people, um, like senior developers even. Um, so that's, that's one of the, yeah, one of the frustrating parts of having, like, something that is, um, like, safe in C++ and then not safe in, in Python. Um, it'd be kind of nice if we could enforce in Python um, constness. So does that imply that at that, some though. point in your bindings there's actually a const cast or something happening? 
I think the bindings might return a const object, but Python doesn't do anything with that const. Python doesn't care if an object is const or not. Right. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. I don't know. I'm thinking at what point can they actually modify it? If it has a const object and then they're able to call a non-const member function on it, that means at some point in your bindings the constness was dropped. Because otherwise the bindings themselves wouldn't be able to generate the code to call the non-const member function. Something had to get lost. Yeah, probably when uh, when the object is being returned, like it needs to be put into some sort of generic container, right? Like um, it it knows it's a pointer to a fold tree, but Python can't distinguish between pointers to fold trees and pointers to constant fold trees. Right. And so it right. just casts away at that moment. That sounds um, probably right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, then just. I'm curious what tools you're using now that we've gone this far to generate your Python bindings. Or are you? For a while, um, we were using PyBind 11 and, and Boost. Um, but uh, uh, at a certain point, that was um, it was just leading to too many headaches. And so a developer in the community, um, Sergey Leskov, developed um, his own um, uh, Python wrapping uh, library, which he calls Binder, um, and so that's uh, that's available um, and is and is open source, um, and he supports it actively. I can't tell you too much about how it works though, um, but it's pretty neat stuff. Um, and I know that it's now much easier to compile PyRosetta yourself. Um, so if you're a developer and you're um, adding new functionality. Um, but you want to use that functionality immediately, um, then you can just compile your own Python bindings. And that used to be very difficult. Um, the other way of getting Python bindings is to wait until the um, testing server like updates. And then I think we have like a weekly release schedule so that you can download last week's version of, of PyRosetta right now. Um, yeah, most of our most of our tools are sort of hand rolled. Um, we're not a uh, uh, using a, a ton of things that maybe we should be. Uh, it'd be nice to have, I don't know, like a better sense of what tools are out there that we should be using. Uh, I mean, I've used Swig for Python bindings, but it has its own different set of headaches. So it's, you know, you pick your poison. I, I personally like Boost Python. That always treats me well when I, for my own personal projects. But... Um, this binder tool that we use for Rosetta, it, um, like we never have to think about it. It just works. And I don't know how much overhead was required to get that in a state where it is, but, um, you know, you can pass lambdas between the two languages. You can, and any complication you can think of, it just works. Yeah, it's nice to be able to subclass the C++ classes in Python and then hand them back to... Um, hmm. like containers that take those classes, right, and and have Python functions being invoked by C++. Um, it's uh, a really nice feature, especially if you're if you're creating like a protocol that has multiple stages, like at stage five to have that implemented in Python, but using um, like the C++ code for stages one through four. Yeah, that feels like magic when you do that kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, if, if the listeners have never, um, if they use Python and they've never tried um, bindings before, I highly recommend it. I never really liked Python until I had that power, and it um, it just feels incredible. So. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Jack, I was wondering if you might want to tell us a little bit more about uh, the work you mentioned in your bio with uh, using quantum computing and machine learning with Rosetta. Yeah, sure. Um, so just to quickly re-summarize the problem that we work in, uh, the protein itself is a linear chain of units, um, like beads on a necklace, to use Andrew's uh, analogy. And the chain itself is flexible, but each bead can also adopt one of 20 different chemistries. Um, so there's this uh, um, 
two different sampling states because the chemistries are flexible themselves. So while the, while the big main chain can fold in on itself in many different ways, each bead can adopt uh, one of hundred or thousand uh, different states. So there's a combinatorial optimization problem with the beads changing states with a, um, a very large sample space problem of the main chain changing shape. Um, what, what I do mostly is protein design, which is where you can change the chemistries of the protein to uh, optimize the behavior of it in the cell. And when you do that, then you're mostly focusing on the state changing um, sampling. So you can, um, your, your, the main chain of your protein is already in some confirmation that you want to keep. But the chemistries of each bead on the chain, um, you want to be able to change. And like I said, there are tens or hundreds or thousands of different states for hundreds of different beads. Um, so the combinatorial optimization of that problem is the inner loop of sampling. And then the outer loop, you allow the main chain to slightly modify to adopt uh, chemistry changes. So it's... Um, uh, the inner loop as a combinatorial optimization problem translates well for quantum computers. And that's what we're doing at Menton AI is mapping the Rosetta uh, uh, inner loop of what we call um, packing, where you try and fit these chemistries in a dense protein core. And you, uh, you map that into a combinatorial optimization system that can be put there are already tools for that on classical computers, but quantum's on the rise, so we're trying to jump on that. Um, and then with the outer loop, we're trying to drive that with machine learning. So we're doing quantum rapid machine learning. What is it? I mean, are you programming in C++ on the quantum computer? Like, how does it, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have collaborators that, do the quantum computer programming for us. All we need to do for that is set up the um, set up the problem, and then there's an API. Um, I would be surprised if it was C++. I think it's very low-level machine code. Okay. Uh, I've never looked at it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now my, my full understanding of quantum computing in general comes from science fiction. As I understand it, you set up the problem, and then someone in an alternate reality provides you the answer. <laughs> Pretty sure that's how it works. Yeah, that's, I mean, for us, um, the alternate reality is in Toronto. But okay, that sounds <laughs> about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really neat. So the quantum computer itself manifests your problem in real life at a very small quantum level, and then uses real physics to sample the landscape of uh, solutions to your problem and uh, leverages advanced physics that I never got deep into uh, to understand um, to use, you know, real life physics to find the solution to your computational problem. So it physically models the problem effectively. Yeah, yeah. Now, there are some shortcuts that need to be taken um, with modern day quantum computers, so you don't always get the best solution, but we're investing now so that as quantum computers get better, hopefully we can take better use of it. Interesting. I have no idea what any of that means. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fun, though. It's fun. it's fun to be at the level where we are, where we don't need to write the code that goes on the quantum computer, but we get to use it. Right. And just at a ballpark, like how much faster is its results than what you were doing with classical algorithms? Well, we're limited at the moment by the size of the quantum computers, but that's that's quickly going away. It's a rapidly growing field. But for all of the problems um, that we're running now, they can be solved on classical computers. So at the moment, there's no there's no runtime advantage right now. Oh, okay. But to be um, fair, the problems, when they're being solved on the classical computer, I mean, they're NP-complete, so we're just approximating. Right, uh, you're approximating in either case. Uh, or... uh, a stochastic technique for, for doing um, the optimization. But, um, like, so the, yeah, the quantum computer is supposed to give you the answer, except when it doesn't. Um, and so, 
Uh, so sometimes it gets, you know, sig- uh oh. I, I guess I'll finish the thought. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes um, the quantum computer doesn't always give you the best answer, but in theory, if you had a, a sizable computer, it, it will. Um, I don't know the total limitations. Um, like they, they operate at very low temperatures and um, there are physical limitations to the size of problem you can sample, but you can approximate to fit larger problems. Um, I'm, if, if listeners are interested in this, there's a preprint out from our company at Menton AI, um, and maybe I can send that to you for the show notes. So Absolutely. If yeah. you sure. look up, Vikram Mulligan is the big name behind it, Hans Melo, um, and it, it's an interesting problem. Uh, I'm excited to learn more about it. I've only been at Menton AI a few months now, so I'm still, um, I haven't personally run the quantum program yet. Now, again, just based on my science fiction research from what I know of quantum computing, the other problem is that it could give you the the answer yesterday and you missed it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm yeah, pretty that's sure that's right, right true. <laughs> what, uh, so Vikram, like I mentioned, uh, he pointed out to me that uh, if there are ultimate, alternate uh, dimensions and Jack McGuire is running a quantum computer in one dimension and Jack McGuire is running a quantum computer in a different dimension, we'll get different results. So somewhere... There's a Jack McGuire that just got a really good Rosetta result from the quantum computer, and then I just got, you know, the average one. Or maybe I'm the one that got the good result. So it's, it's all, you know, the science fiction is very much in play. That's great. And just terrible. on a side note, since we're talking about quantum computing and, and science fiction, uh, there was a great show that just started on Hulu called Devs. I would recommend it. It's all about quantum computing and oh. software developers using it. Very cool. All I can say is you all are using quantum computers to help generate novel proteins. This sounds like the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll find out soon. <laughs> we'll the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, Andrew, you talked a lot about you know some of the successes of uh, what's you know being done and solved with Rosetta and you know progress with HIV vaccines. Uh, you know, at the risk of pissing off our listeners by talking about COVID again, is there any chance that there's people out there like trying to make a COVID vaccine using Rosetta proteins, Rosetta yeah. design proteins? Uh, so another th- another thing that um, people have done is uh, is design little cages, um, like little balls of protein, um, and then on those things you can present um, protein, other proteins on them. Um, and so there's actually uh, uh, a Rosetta lab out of uh, Seattle um, uh, that's making a uh, COVID um, vaccine, basically. Uh, so they've taken the S protein from COVID, and um, I think they had uh, been looking at it before. So, I mean, coronaviruses have been around for forever. Um, and, and this particular one, um, COVID SARS-2, um, They've taken its um, protein and uh, and put it on their um, their nano cage system and are, are looking to see if that will lead to a vaccine. Um, I know. I mean, uh, this isn't Rosetta, but um, there are people who are. Um, oh, this is just biology. Uh, but uh, um, another strategy for this vaccine that um, I happen to have a friend in Seattle who um, was part of the vaccine trial for um, is to take the. Um, the gene, basically, for or one of the genes, um, as um, as not DNA, but instead RNA, and inject it into you, and then you'll just make that protein. Um, and because uh, we're very good at fighting, like, or, or identifying pathogens if they come in looking like pathogens, but if we just get like instructions of how to build proteins, we'll just take those instructions. It's like a almost a computer virus, right? And start executing those instructions, make the proteins. Um, and then, uh, uh, then you have um, this foreign protein that you, that's sort of circulating in your body, um, and it can elicit an immune response. So that's um, there's a vaccine trial that's like going on right now for that. And then I've got a buddy who got the injection, um, uh, but um, but that's not a Rosetta thing. That's a, another um, company. Um, but yeah, I mean, Rosetta. Go ahead. I was just going to say the short answer is there are a lot of people uh, trying to model COVID right now. 
uh, and Rosetta is one of the big tools to do it. I didn't mean to interrupt though, Andrew. We actually had a a, a virtual conference um, like a week and a half ago, um, where a bunch of people within the Rosetta community were trying to talk about all the different ways that they're using Rosetta to try and tackle this current um, global pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of a lot of exciting work going on. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, um, certainly one of the most exciting is um, trying to get a vaccine. But, you know, if you're going to give a vaccine, uh, uh, you're administering it to a lot of healthy people. Um, and so you need to make sure that it's not going to kill them. Um, and that takes yeah, time, right? Sounds um, handy. You can't just, you can imagine creating the vaccine in a matter of weeks, but making sure that you could actually give it to people and not kill them, uh, that takes, that's what takes the year and a half. Um, and it's a good thing to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, while, while Rosetta and, and lots of other techniques are like gearing up to um, give us vaccines, knowing that any one of them could be used is what's sort of delaying our ability to, to go and use them. My extraordinarily limited biology knowledge, though, you're talking about this protein ball that they could attach other proteins onto. Would the goal be then to expose that protein to your immune system in a harmless way, basically? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's effectively harmless if it's not, um, if it's not able to infect your own cells, right? It's, right. It's just a, a ball. And the purpose of it being a ball is that you have um, like 50 copies of it. Um, and for biochemistry that I won't go into, like the more copies you have, the easier it is to sort of get weak binders that become better binders. Um, and so there are like ways to present um, to the immune system um, a starting point and get it, get it ramped up. Um, so it looks a lot like you imagine the virus itself would look like, except it's doesn't have a virus inside of it. It's just an empty ball. Um, and so it's not going to, it's not going to infect you. It's just um, a mimic. Um, your immune system will still respond to it, get its own antibodies, and then um, be able to uh, react to any invaders that are coming in. Right. Okay. Sounds neat. Well, it's been great having you both on the show today. Is there anything else uh, either of you want to go over before I let you go? Uh, if it's okay, I'd like to mention that Menton is hiring oh, data yeah. scientists more than uh, C++ programmers. But if you're a data scientist listening, machine learning, um, feel free to reach out to Menton. I'll include the website maybe in the show notes. We probably have a few listening. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you both for coming on the show today. Well, thank, thank you, you for having, having us. us. Yeah, thanks for coming.